Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order this, me this meeting of the Pension Review Board Actuarial Committee. And by sight, I see a quorum is present. I would ask Ms. Rendon to please call the roll. Chair Keith Rader. Here. Marsha Dutch. Here. Stephanie Light. Here. Thank you. We are all here and accounted for. Uh, we have one new member of this committee, which is uh, our board chair. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. <clears throat> and our first order of business uh, is uh, to entertain a motion to suspend reading of the minutes of the last meeting. Hard to believe the last meeting was last September. That's what the date says. So I would entertain a motion to suspend reading of the minutes. So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of approving, of approving the suspension of the reading of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. <clears throat> minutes are approved as submitted. Thank you, staff, for your work on the minutes. The Pension Review Board is statutorily tasked with conducting reviews of public pension plans that may be in danger of not making their promise, paying their promised benefits. And uh, that is what we are about in the first portion of this meeting this morning. Um, we're going to look at the Odessa Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund, and I'd like to ask the Pension Review Board Staff Actuary, Kenny Herbold, to please come forward and uh, provide his report. Welcome, Kenny. Thank you, members. Good afternoon. Uh, if I can uh, direct your attention to tab 2A, we have the uh, draft of Odessa Fires uh, Relief and Retirement Fund Intensive Review. Uh, just as a, to start off and kind of as a quick reminder, um, there was uh, uh, one unusual aspect about uh, why we chose this plan. The city actually asked us uh, a little while ago to, to take a look at the plan. Um, so while we probably would have selected them based on the, uh, the various metrics that we use anyway, uh, that was included uh, as one of the reasons that uh, uh, we started taking a look. So I do want to mention that they have recently, um, a few years ago, I guess, uh, uh, submitted a funding soundness restoration plan so that as part of that, they made a number of uh, benefit changes, and they made benefit changes across the board, so all active members uh, did take a benefit cut. It wasn't just for new hires. Uh, they've also uh, increased contributions for both employers, uh, the employer and the employee. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it, it doesn't appear that it's enough at this point, uh, and so we want to kind of run through some of the additional things that, that we found uh, as we were uh, looking at, at what's been happening. So I'd like to... Uh, uh, direct your attention. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, new graphs in this as well, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of explaining uh, what some of these things are that are a little bit different than some of the um, some of the graphs we've had in the past. Uh, but one of the you know one of the things that really stands out, uh, they do have a fund exhaustion date of 16 years, so that's a GASB required um, uh, reporting. Uh, so it's a it's a specific calculation that GASB. Um, requires as part of uh, each uh, annual financial report. Uh, so one of the things, though, we don't necessarily want to use that uh, to say that they're going to run out of money in 16 years because it's a closed group projection. It doesn't take into account uh, any new employees and any money associated with, with the new employees. So in the majority of our projections, uh, what we've done is we've tried to do an open group projection to kind of look at what's going to happen when you know, they have new hires come replace any of the retirees, um, and anybody that terminates that type of thing. Uh, what we did find, though, that even when you take into account the new money for new employees, they still are uh, expected to run out of money in less than 25 years. And that is assuming that they earn an average of 7.75% uh, on their assets uh, in all future years as well. So it's uh, some fairly rosy uh, investment return assumptions, uh, and they're still running out of money. So. That was a pretty big concern, something we, um, we decided to take a little bit of a closer look at. So on page four, you can see we did a little bit of um, scenario testing, some stress testing to look at you know, what happens if they don't do as well in some years. Uh, just to keep this, um, I, I guess, uh, comparable, we are still assuming 
that the average rate of return in all years is going over a 30 year period is going to be 7.75%. So in any projection, uh, you can see the, the red um, line is a shock in 2030. So we're, we're actually assuming that they earn more than 7 775 for the next 10 years, and then there's a minus 20% shock in 2030, and then more than 7.75% every single year thereafter as well. So I think it um, comes out to 8.71%, so almost uh, a full 100 basis points above their assumed rate of return in most years except for this one, and they're still running out of money in less than 25 years, right? So there is definitely some uh, some concern associated with that. Kenny, may I interrupt? Please? Absolutely, please. Um, the plan has not been receiving their actuarially determined contribution. Does this chart assume that they are receiving their ADC or that they're receiving the current rate of contribution? It, it assumes their current rate of contributions, which I believe is 18% employees and 20% uh, employer contributions. Thank you. Kenny, and, and your projection assumes replacement. Correct. It's, uh, so the the, uh, the liability projections were actually provided by Foster and Foster, uh, and they are uh, assume replacement. So the, it's a steady active population. Thank you. So uh, we, we um, obviously you know having a fund exhaustion date is uh, is a, is definitely a concern. Usually it's an indication of uh, you know not enough money coming in. Uh, so we do have one of our standard graphs on page five where we're looking at, you know, you can see the unfunded accrued liability growing. Um, the assets are, are remain relatively flat over this entire period while uh, the accrued liability is growing close to 10 percent up until uh, right around 2016, which is when uh, the FSRP came into play uh, and they made those benefit reductions uh, on future accruals. And so you can see that, you know, it's kind of uh, leveled out to some degree. Um, but part of the issue here is that when we're, when we're um, digging into what's actually going on and why the assets aren't growing, uh, essentially what we're seeing, um, you know, you can see that we've got the funded ratio also on this graph on page five. It's continuing to grow. Part of the problem is that essentially the contributions that are coming in the door are going right back out for benefit payments because they're con they're, they have a significant negative investment cash flow or non-investment cash flow, right? So it's their, they're starting to act like a pay-as-you-go plan, and as the assets continue to decrease, they're going to get closer and closer to a pay-as-you-go plan. So they're not, at this point, they're not really pre-funding any benefits that are being accrued. And it, the big part is because the contributions as they come in aren't sufficient to cover the, um, excuse me, aren't sufficient to cover the benefit payments. They cover about half of them. Um, and then you, you have to rely on asset growth or you have to start selling assets in order to you know, pay for those benefits. So we have an additional graph that's kind of presented in a slightly different manner on page six to try and illustrate what's actually going on. Uh, you can see in 2017, uh, it would have taken, uh, well, so what we're showing here, right, we have uh, the employer contributions and employee contributions on the left-hand side as a percentage of be beginning year assets. And then on the right-hand side, we show benefits paid. Uh, and then we've also added on the normal cost and the interest on the unfunded to give an idea of how much the assets would need to return in order to one cover benefit payments and then cover start pre-funding benefits by covering the normal cost as well as start trying to start pay off the unfunded accrued right so we've got in 2017 it required just a 10.6 percent return for the year in order to fully cover um, uh, their benefit payments uh, and again in 2018 it was about 7.2 percent return so uh, with the 7.7 percent assumed rate of return uh, it's going to be rather difficult to actually get that uh, asset balance to start moving in the direction you want it to go and get that funded ratio back up. So because of all of this, right, they're subject to a revised funding soundness restoration plan. Um, but part of the our concern is that an adjustment to benefits isn't going to address any of these short-term cash flow issues, right? So putting money, more money into the plan right now or increasing contributions in order to start covering some of this seems like it's going to be an absolute necessity in order to turn the plan start turning the plan around 
Now we're not saying that long term, you know, long term benefits aren't uh, uh, something to be considered, uh, but definitely uh, in the near term, contribution changes uh, are probably uh, abs- you know, going to be necessary. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on page nine, uh, what we've done is we've done some uh, alternative contribution uh, projections, and so this uh, again assumes seven point seven five percent return. Uh, we did incorporate. Um, uh, one alternative um, investment scenario uh, similar to the the previous graph where we have the next five years um, we assume uh, they they are in five percent for five years and then the last 25 years they're getting uh, above 7.75 percent so the average over 30 years is going to be um, 7.75 percent so what we've shown is a, a, just a, a 10 percent increase and maintain a fixed contribution rate. That's the light blue lines uh, and the, the, the top uh, in the legend. Uh, the red line is a closed ADC, uh, actual determined contribution. And this is actually, it's not a layered um, amortization. This is strictly a 30 year closed uh, contribution. So that's why, although it goes off the top of the page, in 2050 they would be 100% funded uh, regardless of whether there's gains or losses or anything like that. So contributions would adjust upwards uh, in this particular case uh, to address any possible losses. And then the uh, third uh, option that we looked at was essentially a cash infusion um, of of approximately $18 million. Um, The reason we chose the $18 million is that's what would be necessary in order to reduce uh, their uh, the projected funding period to approximately 30 years, the maximum uh, recommended by the, the PRB pension funding guidelines. Uh, obviously, you know something that takes into account uh, all of these or you know different combinations uh, is certainly a, a consideration. Whether it's cash infusion now, um, coupled with uh, you know change to an ADC or something like that. But one of the things you can see though is well, cash infusion uh, certainly helps the near term. Uh, that's actually the one without an additional contribution increase. You can start to see that after 2034, it starts to, you know, kind of lose uh, it, its the amount that it's helping, right? So that funded ratio is actually starting to go down uh, while the others are sort of addressing uh, so, some of the longer term uh, longer term issues. And, and again, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, while cash a cash infusion is certainly uh, an important aspect to address uh, the near-term issues. Uh, benefits could certainly be considered for um, a long to address long, longer-term issues. So one of the things we wanted to do was to provide uh, some some idea of where those benefits currently sit. And there's a number of different ways that you can you know kind of uh, compare this information across plans. Uh, what we've done is we've calculated uh, the present value of future benefits of the um, benefit that the retiree would would be expected to receive at full retirement. And so one of the things that this does, rather than comparing, say, like replacement rates, um, it kind of equalizes for different um, uh, payment forms as well as for different retirement ages. So one of the changes that Odessa made was to uh, increase the retirement age. I I believe it was from 50 to 55 uh, to get their full benefit. and so this kind of takes into account the fact that you're been, even if you get the exact same replacement rate, if you get it five years later, it's less valuable. So we're trying to take that into account. And I do apologize. One of the things that this doesn't point out is that Odessa does contribute to Social Security as well. Uh, so that has an impact, uh, obviously, on the contribution side as well as on the benefit side. Um, so they're going to get a, a Social Security benefit. And, and out of these plans, I believe McAllen and Odessa are the only two that actually contribute to Social Security. Uh, so the, the others, the benefits are fairly accurate. There would be slightly higher benefits when you take into account Social Security for uh, Odessa and for McAllen. Um, and then again, it doesn't really address the impact of employee contributions as well, which is uh, certainly a consideration, right? So if they have the highest benefit, but they also have the highest employee contribution, uh, that should be taken into account. Whereas, um, and so we didn't include everything on here, but those are all things that that definitely need to be considered as uh, the system and uh, uh, the city are considering how to actually address uh, the long-term, the long-term issues. So, yep. That is what they're contributing to this fund that 
that you'd have to add on what, what the employee or the employer is contributing to Social Security um, to get a total uh, contribution for retirement. Similarly, for the employee, if they're contributing 18%, that's what's going into this fund. Right, plus another six plus percent into Social Security uh, for each for the employer and the employee. Correct. Thank you. And so we do um, in the appendix we do have a, a peer group uh, table that um, identifies which plans um, are uh, contributing to Social Security and which are not. So we'll, we will add something to this graph to make it a little bit more apparent um, here for the final version. But I um, just wanted to let you, make you aware that it, the information is in the appendix as well. So, you know, one of our uh, primary recommendations, um, obviously there are a couple of uh, new um, requirements uh, that the plans are going to have to follow that we'll be discussing uh, today and tomorrow, right? They have a funding policy requirement. Uh, it's a good opportunity to um, the plan for the plan and the system to work together to, you know, kind of talk through the issues and figure out what they actually need to be doing to get themselves to full funding. So that, that's one opportunity, uh, but, um, you know, they, they have the revised FSRP requirement. Uh, that's again another opportunity for them to work together and uh, figure out where they need to go. But a as I stated, you know, the FSRP requirement focuses on um, amortization period. It doesn't necessarily look at, you know, the exhaustion date. And so because a cash infusion is most likely needed, they probably need to be looking beyond just the requirements of uh, the revised FSRP and getting themselves to a 40-year amortization period. Um, so they, they probably need to be focused more on the funding policy side that requires uh, some sort of plan to get to full funding. Can, can you, based on the information that you reviewed, can you tell us how we got here? You know, is this that they had, they didn't make the assumed rate of return? Is it that is it just the difference between what a uh, actuarially determined contribution and the fixed rate contributions are? You know, essentially, where why are we here? Um, they definitely. They, so we don't have um, all of uh, all of the detail included in here, but we do have in uh, the appendix. We have. Um, some of their longer term return, longer returns, uh, and they have not been uh, achieving their assumed rate of return. Um, we weren't able to do, we didn't have sufficient information to do one of the, the graphs like we have for, for Paris where we examine uh, the causes of the, the change in the unfunded accrued liability. Um, but generally speaking, yes, they, uh, they're going to be in a similar situation to a lot of other plans where they're, they're not hitting their assumed rate of return, so that's going to be part of the issue. Their contributions are below, generally speaking, are below the 30-year uh, the rolling ADC, not even a, a, you know, a closed amortization period, but the 30-year rolling um, ADC. And then if you look at their non-investment cash flow, they've had negative non-investment cash flow since 2001. Um, it was the first few years, um, and I think we have a, this one. We have a graph in the appendix uh, shows the non negative non or the non-investment cash flow, um, and so around 2006, it looks like it started to drop close to negative four percent, and then since then, it, it's just gotten uh, significantly worse. Now, part of that is going to be because their assets are also going down, right? So if they're but even if their benefit payments stayed exactly the same, the negative non-investment cash flow calculation, because it's as a percentage of their total assets, that would probably go up as well. Um, but it, it is a concern to have such um, a large negative number when you're not fully funded, right? When, you're, when your assets are not sufficient um, to, to cover things and you're having to rely on your contributions um, to make the benefit payments, then that certainly uh, uh, one of the concerns that uh, you know, should, should, should raise some red flags at, at, as we look at things. Kenny, did you have more on Odessa that you wanted to report, or is that the end of your prepared remarks on Odessa? Um, that's pretty much everything. We have a couple of other uh, uh, recommendations, but... Um, you if know. you'd like to touch on those recommendations, that'd be fine, please. Sure, we did. Um, you know, obviously, I mentioned the, the funding policy requirement we mentioned um, and the, uh, the revised FSRP. Uh, and again, there's, there are some additional requirements associated with uh, Senate Bill 322 that we'll be discussing. Um, but it, and as part of that, um, you know, we are recommending that they take a closer look at their asset allocation. Again, because they are um, have such negative non-investment cash flow, they've got a essentially a 15 to 25 year time horizon before they're running out of money. But their asset allocation appears to be based on the assumption that they have, you know 
30 plus years to invest. So they have a pretty high um, um, allocation to equities, to alternative investments, um, to, to more risky investments, where when you have such a short time horizon, you probably need to be looking at, at a more liquid investments, which in turn is going to imply that you can't hit your seven point, you know, such a high uh, assumed rate of return as well. So w we think that um, doing something like that, performing an asset liability study, that allows them, again, to look at their cash flows, what they expect to happen, and how their, their assets uh, and their contributions should be supporting that. Um, and then uh, some, uh, performing some stress testing, uh, similar to something like what we did, or you know, looking at what's going to happen. Uh, we've had a you know, pretty uh, long bull market. There are a lot of uh, you know, projections that say the next 10 years are going to be um, aren't going to be quite so rosy, and so you know, taking a look at uh, what could happen uh, over the next few years if they don't hit their their target returns or the contributions don't grow the way they expect to. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions for Kenny. Stephanie? I just have one question. Thanks. Um, going back to the first graph on page nine for the thirty-year close contribution, were you all able to quantify? What that contribution would look like? Um, we did. Uh, we didn't. We didn't graph it. We have. Um, we do have that information though, um, that we can we can provide to you. I, I think my, my memory says it, it was, for the most part, it was slightly above the forty eight percent expected contribution. But again, because it adjusts, it automatically adjusts. So, um, it, it moves. The needle to 100% uh, faster than just a fixed rate contribution would. Okay. <clears throat> and Kenny, when you're talking about that 30 year close contribution, you're still talking as about it being based on mm -hmm. payroll. So the contribution today uh, in, in dollar amounts is less than it would it be next year or the following year because you're, they're still increasing with pay? The yes, it's, it's still based on an assumption that the dollar amount of the contribution would increase uh, at 3.5%, which is the payroll growth assumption. Uh, if, that, if that's all the questions from the committee for Kenny, good. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to ask representatives of the city and the Odessa Fire Fund to please come forward and introduce yourselves. Thank you, Kenny. Welcome. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourselves beginning with you, ma'am? Cindy Muncy, I'm the Interim Assistant City Manager of our, of our Administrative Services. I oversee finance, budget, and other various departments for the city. Thank you. Jeff Swanson, I'm with Southeastern Advisory Services. I am the investment consultant on the plan. My name is Brad Heinrichs. I'm with Foster and Foster, and I am the actuary. Good to see you guys again. Good to see you. Travis Jones, I'm the chairman for the Odessa Pension Board. Welcome. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to start just by saying... Bef before you begin, I, I'd like to make a comment if I could. Um, I want to commend the city of Odessa and the firefighters and the police officers there, the other first responders, the police chief and the mayor for your response to the recent uh, events. Thank you very much. You represented your city very well at a difficult time for that city, that area, and the state. Please let them know on behalf of this entire board that we appreciate what they did. We noticed it and uh, let them know that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Sir, please proceed. All right, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the board for having us here this morning. Um, I'd like to thank Kenny for the amount of time and detail that and, and him and his team put into that report. Um, I think what we'd like to do here is we would like for you all to allow all of us have a chance to talk and uh, so we'll each touch on a different subject. Here. Please. Um, I'd like to just say that you know, we knew that our plan was in trouble um, way before this ever even started, back before the FSRP in 2016. Um, those board members that were on the board then are, are gone. It's a completely new board. It's a problem that we're trying to deal with that we recognized early and we've been trying to deal with um, since. When Foster and Foster first come to us, um, 
with their study that they did for us, we, you know, they showed us that we needed to come up with 24% more pay to to even think about getting this fund healthy. Um, I don't know if y'all realize this, but the firemen come up with 20% of that pay ourselves. You know, the city come up with another 4%. That's a big chunk of change for the firemen. Uh, plus, we pay into Social Security. We're hiring new firemen, and you know, me and myself, 25% of my paycheck goes to retirement right off the bat. I don't even get to see that part. Um, I feel like this board has done a tremendous amount in trying to fix this problem and adjust this problem. I realize that we still have a ways to go. We still have some things to do, and, and we're working on that. Uh, we kind of feel like that we've done about as much as we can on the benefits side of it. We've cut almost all of our benefits. I'd say we cut, we did cut all of our benefits. Uh, just to comment on the report Kenny made, uh, there was two discrepancies in the report, which I'm sure you're all aware of. It was in our rebuttal there that uh, we do pay into Social Security and that we do have a 20-year vest with a full payment at 25 still. It's it's not a 25-year vest. It is still 20-year vest. Uh, Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, sir. One other thing not included in this report, and I know we had talked about it over the phone, is that we, and, and at the time of the phone, we weren't quite yet approved. But we knew that we were in the process, or hopefully in the process, of building a new fire station and adding new employees. That since has been approved. Uh, we are going to build a new fire station and add new employees. Uh, once we found that information out, we asked Foster and Foster to do another study for us to try to see what those additional employees, what kind of benefit they would have on our plan. Uh, I believe that that was handed out to you all earlier this morning. I'd like to point out that that study was based on a maximum of 210 employees. Um, after talking with the chief, and he can touch on this more, at the end of those two years, it looks like we're going to be closer to 240 employees. So that's even quite a bit difference. Um, if you can look at that report there by Foster and Foster, I'd like to point out that by 2026, the, the last year of our FSRP, According to that report, we are under our 40-year amortization period by 2026. So one of the things we'd like to ask here is that you reconsider the suggestion of us at re changing our FSRP or, or uh, and, and giving us the opportunity to try to get closer to reach that 40-year mark by 2026. Thank you. Well, you like to steal my thunder, don't you? <laughs> um, again, I'm Brad Heinrichs. I'm the actuary. I, I think that, that board member Dush asked a really good question earlier, which was, how did we get here? What, what, what happened to get us to this, to this point? And, and, and part of our response that I think was, fault, that was passed along to you um, in a September 5th, 2019 letter, I don't know if you guys have a copy of it, um, I, I attempted to to document uh, everything that's gone on with this pension fund since that since since 2015 when we were hired, um, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time. I think it's I think it's instructive for everybody to really get a grasp as to where this where this fund has been um, in the past, where we are today, and, the, and where we think we're going to be going in the future. Um, in 2015, we were engaged and in, in, uh, to, to become the new actuary, and it was a, it was a, as as uh, the chair here said, it was a fairly new board at the time. Um, when we when we uh, got to looking at the actuarial assumptions, we noticed that uh, some things troubled us. Uh, first, uh, we noticed that they they used to, they had just lowered their assumed rate of return from 8.5 down to 8.25. Um, and and that was that was a pretty high assumption rate, as you as you're probably aware. Um, we noticed the payroll growth rate and the salary increase rate were assumptions were, were both four and a half, the same. That's a high payroll growth rate, 
and a low salary increase assumption. And in fact, it's really difficult to have them both be the same assumption. We were kind of, we were surprised by that. When we looked and we've noticed that for the last couple of decades, they've had the same number of firefighters, 163 or 164 firefighters for, for decades. Um, it's kind of difficult to, to, to grow payroll growth at four and a half percent when you're not adding any new you're not adding any new any new firefighters through time, um, and and the thing that con that concerned us the most, which made me think, oh boy, we've got a lot of work to do here, and this is going to be difficult and maybe somewhat painful, is that we looked at the the total present value of benefits, and and noticed that over three fourths of the total present value of benefits, meaning the benefits that have been earned or will be earned in the future. Okay, more than three fourths of those benefits have already been earned, so that leaves only twenty. It's only twenty two point six percent of all of the present value benefits that we have to play with if we're going to cut benefits. Because as you know, you can't you can't lower benefits that have already been earned. Okay, and so then when I when I when we look at that and notice, oh gosh, we're 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 at an, an infinity amortization period. Um, this was troubling. So, so we, we went to the board and we, and we and expressed these concerns, and, and the board says, you know, those assumptions do, now that, you, now that you bring this to our attention, maybe we need to take a look at these. And so we did an experience study, as, as you would expect an actuary to do, and, and what did we find? Well, we found exactly what we thought we were going to find. Um, we hadn't been hitting the assumed rate of return for a long time. Um, the salary increases were, were north of six on average um, instead of the four and a half percent that we had been assuming. And lo and behold, the payroll growth wasn't quite what we would, were originally anticipating. And, and, and so the picture that they had originally maybe thought wasn't so, wasn't so bleak at all. In fact, they, I think they'd kind of been led to believe everything's fine, we'll just keep on keeping on. Um, that we've got, a, we've got a sizable gap here to make up some way, some way shape, or form in, in, the, in the form of, of either benefit reductions and or contribution increases. So what did the board do at that time? I thought the board did a tremendous job. The first thing they did, they roped in the city and says, we need to talk about our issues. And, and, and they had the city manager and the finance director all in, 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 in the same room, uh, along with the membership. Uh, I, I, I'm from Florida, and, and I tell you, I uh, got to know the flight attendants on the American Airlines from, from Florida to Odessa, Texas, because I've spent a lot of time talking to the members in Odessa. And, and the, the, this board, we, we spent a lot of time educating the members as to w where we're at, what needs to happen here. And, and it took some convincing. And I'll tell you, these board members took a beating. Um, you know, the, maybe the, these guys can talk, talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But um, they eventually <coughs> convinced these, these members to change benefits. And when I say change benefits, I mean, we're talking about big time changes to benefits to, this, to, to a greater extent than any public safety plan that our firm's been involved with. And we work for about probably about 300 nationwide, okay? Um, to give you more perspective other than just my hyperbole here, uh, the normal cost, which is the cost of all of the active firefighters earning a year of service, okay? Um, after the change of benefits, that normal cost was 15% for the entire group, okay? The members are contributing 18%. For a new hire today, okay, for a new hire, the normal cost is 13% of pay. They're contributing 18. So what that means is that not only are they, pay, are they fully paying for their pension benefit, the accrual of their pension, they're paying an extra 5% to pay down the unfunded liability. Okay, that's, that is a substantial, substantial uh, discrepancy or difference than, than what you find with other pension funds. Um, so what did the board do? They adopted assumption changes. They lowered the assumed rate of return by 50 basis points. Would I like it to be a lower? Sure, but it's at least below. It was at eight, eight and a half, then eight and a quarter. We went to seven and three quarters. At least we're in the ballpark now. Brad, have you recommended a lower rate? Yes, yes, um, and and that's something that we we would like to work to. Um, the reason why we did not um, push them. Like, Push harder is because they said, and I and I understand this. They said, you know, 
we're changing the way we're going to do business on the investment side. They've completely overhauled, and, and Jeff is going to talk about that, the way that they invest money. Um, and I'll, I'll defer to Jeff in a minute to, to talk about that. Um, but that is something that I would like to see um, over time that, that rate come down. Thank you. Brett, yes. I do. I want to follow up on that, but you are aware of the actual standards of practice. Of course. Are you, um, are you documenting or qualifying your results when you're publishing at seven and three quarters, I'm, I'm not. I'm not because of you know th when I made the recommendation to lower the assumed rate, I was assuming that the the investment allocation and policy and everything that they had in place was going to stay the same. They've they've since undergone a complete overhaul and change in the way that they're they're investing their money, and that's going to be something that I'm going to continue to to look at. All right, I I do have yes. a concern about whether or not you should be documenting this at mm -hmm. seven and three quarters yeah. um, I mean that is very high compared right. to what other uh, large plans with, with more robust not as mature plans mm -hmm. I mean the concern sure. here is with the the big negative cash flow that that you're not going to be able to benefit from you can't look at a 30-year projection you really need to be focusing mm -hmm. On, on what's going to happen over the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And the seven and three quarters, I think, is... It's still high. I, it's yeah. still high, and on I'm concerning end. that you just keep you keep kicking the can. I mean, sure. there's a big problem here that yeah. needs to be yeah. addressed, and I'm afraid that you're still masking some of it with the seven and three quarters. Imagine how rate. I felt when it was eight and a quarter. Absolutely. Or eight and, and, and a half. Yeah. I uh, mean, I think it's great that you've updated, you know, all of the assumptions that, you know, I think you even mentioned maybe mortality assumptions and things like that. Yes. So there's a lot of, of good things happening here. I'm just afraid that, again, if you think you've got a cure, but, but capital market assumptions, you know, are borne out and you're not hitting the seven and three quarters, you've just essentially put them back in the same bucket that they're in right now. Understood. And, 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 and you know, I, I think that if you look holistically, and I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, and I, and I agree with m most of all of your comments there, um, and, and I think an asset allocation study is is on is in the cards for for this for these folks in the next uh, in the next six months or a year, Jeff, mm -hmm. um, and that will and the I think the assumption rate will emanate a lot from from Jeff's work in that regard. Well, and I think it's got to be a marriage of the of, liability of and cash flows with the assets because I think that's where the problem is here. We mm -hmm. may be looking at asset allocation expected returns based on. You know, uh, a, a thriving fund that may increase, whereas right. we've got a situation here where we're we're showing a flat or decreasing fund, and Understood. and that's very concerning. And, yeah, and, and and I think that that concern, while it's still concerning, I think when we when you hear the rest of what I have to say, I think the concern will at least be alleviated a little bit by some of the work that we've done in the last month or two, and, we'll, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Okay. Um, so as, as I was mentioning, these these members agreed to substantial reduction in, in every way, shape, or form. Working longer, freezing the plan benefits, and then restarting, higher AFCs, getting rid of drops and colas, and, and just you name it. They, they basically... Uh, Cut benefits substantially to, to the to the current members, um, and and to the tune of uh, the like I said the the total normal cost rate is is now fifteen percent for the entire group when they're contributing eighteen and for new hires it's around thirteen percent. Um, to the to the comment that that Mr. Herbal met made that you know about reducing benefits. I should mention that on page three in my in my letter, that you should notice that the percentage of accrued present value benefits to total, okay, the the percentage of the overall pie that's already been earned, okay, is now 85 percent. That means there's only 15 percent of, of of future benefit accruals that that are going to be earned, and so you can only you can't gut the fish anymore, really. I mean, it's 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 it, there's not much more that you can do. Um, from a benefits standpoint, um, contributions, sure, um, and and we can talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, now, 
something I so then so then we, we, we move along and uh, we do the 2019 actuarial valuation <laughs> and the 2019 actuarial valuation okay, 1 1 2019 came at a rotten time because if you recall the last quarter of 2018 the stock market really took a tumble and and this fund like all of our calendar year funds uh, really struggled for the for the calendar year um, I don't remember what the exact return was do you remember Jeff uh, it, it, if you don't know off the top of your head, no big deal. But they they, they, they didn't meet their assumed rate for the year because of that, that last quarter. Um, and and so the amortization period popped uh, up to, to 77.5 years. Um, and, and 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 certainly that was that was something that Kenny mentioned in his in his report and I, I you know well stated. The forty year funding cost was four point seven five percent more than what's currently being contributed based upon the most recent actuarial valuation. Okay, and so when we started talking to the board about about this this meeting and and you know where are we? Well, one of the things that that Jeff mentioned to me and to the board was that well you know the, those investment returns that we lost in the last quarter have, have largely been recouped in in 2019 and 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 uh, the the sort of the up to date return for for calendar 2019 was 13% net of fees um, that's kind of where we're at today and so uh, we said well maybe we can update our our analysis to to see where we really really are today um, with this net added information and, and, and I started to do that. Um, in fact, I didn't start, I finished it. Uh, and and this, this letter that I just delivered to the board a couple of days ago, or maybe a day ago, um, no time like the present. And uh, if you look at this, this September 17th report, and you go to the last page, page seven, I'll just cut to the chase so you see where, where we're at. On that last page in the exhibits, um, we, we show a baseline scenario that basically says, as of one one nineteen, if we if we um, <coughs> earn our seven point seven seven five, whether it's optimistic or not, let's just say we do. What happens? Well, you see, in twenty twenty, we go to infinity. Well, we had assumed we had we had investment losses that were going to be pouring into the fund because we do we do asset smoothing, and so what's going to be we're going to go to two we're going to go to infinity next year. Um, even if we earn 7.75, um, and that was a bit of bad news to, to the group. Um, but then, if you look at scenario two, if we say, well, if we include our 13% investment return and just say we were flat for the rest of the year, uh, then what happens? In scenario two, if you look at the amortization period, the the, the 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 column almost to the far right, well, same thing. <laughs> so. Nice that we recoup the investment returns, but we're still at infinity. And if you look at the far right column, you see the city's 40-year cost. The city's contributing 20% of pay. And so you can see that we're still 4 or 5% of pay on an annual basis away from a 40-year amortization. Okay? But then there was another piece of, of, I'll call it a stroke of good luck from an actuarial standpoint. And that is that I got a call that said, hey, we're going to, as as the chairman here just mentioned, um, we're we're going to add a new fire station, and it's and it's it's a done deal, and we're going to add 30, 40, 50 new firefighters, and so my my actual world mind says, oh wait a minute, so you're telling me that you're going to add a whole bunch of new firefighters, that the normal cost is going to be 13 percent, they're going to be contributing 18, the city's going to be contributing 20 on their pay, so all of that money is going to be that extra five from the members and all 20 is going to be going to pay down the unfunded liability. You know, and I get blank stares from them, but from my perspective, I'm excited about this, right? And so we 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 did a study, uh, and in this study, we said, okay, let's let's phase in, ramp up the 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 number of firefighters that's been 163 or 164 for decades, up into up to as many as 210 um, by the year 2022. Okay, so we added these folks, and we, we took their average average new hire salary and, and infused those folks into the system, as as is going to happen, and remarkable not remarkably as you might expect actually, um, you see that that the amortization period starts tracking down, the bottom the bottom set of, of rows there, scenario three you see the amortization period going from seventy seven down and then twenty twenty six which is when the end of our ten year um, time horizon is in our FSRP we're just under forty years. 
which um, was pretty cool. And and the city's fun 40 year uh, cost is is tracking down as well. Um, now, does this give us a whole lot of margin for error? No. Okay. I, I'm just being honest about that. But I also think that because of these two components, and mainly the biggest component of adding the new fire station with getting up to, and I'm hearing today or yesterday, I heard that they could have as many as 240 firefighters. We only plan for 210. You get an extra 30, those numbers get a whole lot better. Um, Mr. Heinrichs, can you wrap it up, please? We've, we've got to get to some other speakers. You got it. I'm done. Thank you. I Just, think I've got it. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. We appreciate the material you submitted. You. as well as your testimony. Mr. Swanson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the committee for having me. Um, I'm new to Odessa Fire. Our group is uh, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. We're an independent investment consultant. I've been working with public plans for over 25 years. Um, we were hired in the fourth quarter of 2018, um, and I am very impressed by this board. Since that time, we've had nine meetings in, in 10 months. Uh, the board recognized really immediately everything that was in Kenny's review, understanding there was a performance issue when we did our initial work. Uh, in addition to there being a performance issue, the returns were very volatile uh, compared to a number of, of metrics that we have internally. Uh, so, so the board has made really tremendous uh, strides in uh, really uh, turning over the investment program to new advisors. Um, the comments regarding the asset allocation, I agree completely. We chose a baseline al allocation that's in line with a median uh, allocation to public funds. Uh, in doing so, we increased fixed income from 17 to 25 percent. So we have gone to a more neutral posture. But is it the posture that's appropriate for a fund with this cash flow situation? And the answer is most likely no. Uh, we are working very di diligently. We've made a lot of progress, but we do expect to do a complete asset allocation review and have that scheduled for the first quarter of next year. Uh, that said, I think uh, the changes made have already borne fruit. It's uh, just two quarters, but uh, things are, are looking very positive. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Ms. Muncie. Yes, on behalf of the city, um, just wanted to let you know that management is very concerned about the plan and how we go forward with this. Um, they are interested in taking recommendations to the city council for whatever we may need to do to, to make the plan work. I think um, the additional uh, firefighters is a big thing. Um, you know, the oil field in West Texas is booming, and sometimes it's hard to get firefighters in. Uh, we've improved that with um, additional work from our HR department and the fire department in getting recruits coming in. Uh, we've raised some pay there as well for our, our uh, entering firefighters. So I think we're working hard to try to improve that situation, and um, we're 100 percent behind the plan, and so we will take recommendations to the council for what needs to be done. And we're just trying to find out what that really needs to be. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Uh, Chair? Please. May I? Um, Again, I, I would like to go back to the assumed rate of return, the seven and three quarters. Your your material, Mr. Swanson, didn't um, include any reference to that, and and I, I understand that. But again, just based on the asset allocation that you have there, I've recently attended a um, a conference of, of consulting actuaries uh, training on uh, capital markets, and just averaging what what they cited for. Um, large investment uh, providers uh, assumptions regarding different asset allocations and I just averaged it out I, I mean looking at at their projections you might only project for the next 10 years 5% we might be lucky to get an average of 5% going forward for the next 10 years so again I, I, I am very concerned about the seven and three quarters um, and I think you know, if you look at survey data for plans much larger um, than than uh, Odessa, where there's a lot of professional management, even internal to the fund, 
Um, very few are at seven and a half or even higher. So, so again, I, I just want to go on the record to say I, I don't want you to kick the can down, down the pike too much. I am also very concerned about what uh, Mr. Uh, Jones said. You know, you have people contributing more than a quarter of their pay toward retirement between Social Security and this plan, and, and they're contributing 20 percent when their normal cost, the value of their benefit, is maybe 13 percent. And I would think that that really compounds your problem in hiring firefighters. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of see this as a, a, a short-term and a long-term problem. I mean, have you been able, you know, is the number of firefighters up already? I mean, are you higher than 160 right now? We are at 180 right now. Oh, okay. So we are up. But, but this does strike me as, as a big human resource problem when you're kicking in 25% or better of your pay into a retirement fund. Um, and, and so th those, those are my concerns. And what it would really lead me to, would lead my deduction would be is, it, and, and again, going to your projection, you know, even in the rosy scenario, scenario three, mm -hmm. um, you've gone from 70 million of unfunded now to 93 million right. or 94 million right. of unfunded. Mm -hmm. And your assets are just about where they are today at That's the end of your projection. It's a negative amortization with the payroll growth. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I, I just, I think it leads me to think that there needs to be a, one time or multi time shot of money that goes into this plan and brings it up to in order to increase the stability. So that would be my recommendation, but um, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank Stephanie, you. do you have questions? I do not. Okay, I have a few questions, please. <clears throat> um, as far as I can tell, the uh, participants in this plan have given everything there is to give. The benefits have been cut substantially, and they're now paying significantly more than the normal cost, the cost of the benefits that they are accruing. Um, Ms. Muncie, if you would please pass on to the Odessa City Council um, that they need to step up and pay the full actuarially determined contribution, that is a significant portion of the shortfall that this plan uh, is experiencing. Over the last decade, 12 years, the city has been contributing less than two-thirds of the required contribution. So when we hear that the city is completely behind this fund, um, they haven't put their money behind the fund. And the West Texas economy is booming right now. Yeah. Uh, the city of Odessa has significantly increased its uh, revenues, particularly sales tax revenues, over the last couple of years. Y'all have got a lot of money sitting right there. We've got a lot of needs, though, too. This is a, this is a need right, right here. And I know that Odessa prides itself on being a conservative town. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not limited to Odessa, this comment that I'm about to make. This uh, applies, unfortunately, to a significant portion of the, this state. This state prides itself on being conservative. Conservatives pay their bills. And this legislature has consistently failed to pay its pension bills, as have many cities in this state, including the city of Odessa. And the first and most important thing that needs to happen, as far as I'm concerned, in the case of this fire plan, is the city needs to begin to pay its full required contribution. Because every time even a dollar short is paid of that contribution, you're kicking the can down the road. And you're requiring somebody in the future to pick up that tab. The tab is due. It's past due. And so I'd really like to see the city of Odessa make an effort to begin to move toward the full required contribution. I'm convinced that this city, uh, that this plan has not been well served by its consultants in the past. I appreciate the fresh faces here. Uh, I think the actuary and the uh, investment consultant are a breath of fresh air. Um, Frankly, we can talk about the uh, investment return assumption all day long. If the required contribution is not being made, it's an right. academic exercise. That's correct. <clears throat> uh, so the first thing that needs to be happen is that we need to get a commitment to paying the full required contribution. And then we can begin to have serious talks about what the uh, investment return assumption ought to be. Um, the finest, uh, best performing plans in the country right now are looking at both south of 7%. Uh, and that's plans that don't have a cash flow that uh, I think exceeds, or yeah, y'all's cash flow right now exceeds your return assumption. So you hit your return assumption, you're still losing money. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, it'll be interesting to see what return assumption you all end up with, but I'm glad to hear that we've got a uh, asset liability on the study on the horizon uh, that really needs to take into account um, the negative cash flow that this plan is facing. Most public pension plans have a negative cash flow. A negative cash flow by itself is not a problem, but when your negative cash flow is 10%, it's a big problem. And that's what this plan is facing. It's a serious problem. Uh, and it cannot go on for much longer. Obviously, we're looking at depletion dates uh, in the not too distant future. And Chair, Chair Please. Um, again, I would, I would echo your comments about, um, you know, paying an actuarially determined contribution I would also say I would really question whether that actuarially determined contribution should include a negative amortization, you know, that there should be a minimum of at least an amortization payment equal to interest on the unfunded and some amortization of the unfunded, whether it's a 130th or a 140th. But this, this game that we play of, of, you know, calculating amortization payments based on future uh, payroll growth again ha has been a device to kick the can down the road um, and like I said I'm very concerned about um, I know Odessa needs this fire station and it needs these extra employees but again when you're burdening the members with such a heavy retirement cost right. it, you know it's gonna it's gonna run you're gonna be at a very competitive disadvantage and so I keep thinking you know calculate the costs using accurate accurate you know, uh, current uh, assumptions, and then also really consider to consider whether or not in these good times, whether or not you can't throw some extra money into the fund um, to kind of make up for the fact that that you were using overly rosy assumptions in the past and you didn't get decent returns. Uh, one one final comment, if I might, and that is, Ms. Muncy, the, uh, the city of Odessa's CAFR indicates they all have been making the uh, actuarially determined contribution, which is a material misstatement of the truth. And um, I would encourage the city to take a look at that. The auditor ought to know about it. The city financial staff ought to know about it, uh, because that is not the case. The city has not, according to the PRB records, for at, last, at least the last 12 years, the city has not been making its actuarially determined contribution. I know that there are entities that look at that look to know whether or not the plan sponsor is making their required contribution, and that really needs to be corrected. And I'm not directing that at you personally. Please understand, we appreciate you coming all the way out to, to Austin. We appreciate all of you coming out to Austin and taking the time. I know it takes a lot of time to get here, waiting around and so on. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate the testimony that all of you have provided. Thank you. Please keep us posted. Let us know how the PRB staff can be of assistance to you. We're here to help. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to direct staff to finalize the draft intensive review of the Odessa Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund, incorporating changes agreed upon by the committee and any technical changes to present to the full board for a final review at its October 17th meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, on to the Paris Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund, and uh, we'll go through the same process uh, and ask PRB Staff Actuary Kenny Herbold to deliver that report, please. Again, members, I'll direct you to uh, tab 2B where we have the uh, Paris uh, intensive review, the draft of their intensive review. Um, this one is actually uh, set up uh, very much like the ones that we've uh, uh, written in the past. Um, it's a similar story as well. Uh, it's got uh, some similarities to uh, a lot of the things we've seen in the past as well as uh, some of the similarities uh, that we've, we we uh, just talked about with Odessa. Um, so I will direct you to pages uh, three and four. We have a couple of graphs you know, that we've that we've seen before. Um, you know, we have a growing unfunded accrued liability. Uh, investment returns uh, are the primary cause, not hitting uh, the assumed rate of return. Uh, again, are the primary cause of uh, uh, the growth in unfunded accrued liability. But 
If you look at, um, and I apologize, I'll probably jump around a little bit from one graph to another just because there's a, a few things going on that I think are illustrative. Um, if you look again at uh, the graph on page three, the assets are flat, just very similar to Odessa. Uh, and in this particular case, the assets are actually lower than they were in 2001. Uh, and over the past, um, I think, uh, five years, uh, they've lost almost 25% of, of their total value. Uh, so there's, uh, um, there's, there's clearly something going on, uh, because if you look at the graph uh, on the bottom of page four, uh, their investment returns are positive. So that would imply that the assets should at least be growing to some degree. What we find uh, when we look a little bit deeper is uh, a very similar situation. They've got uh, uh, negative uh, non-investment cash flow, and they've had negative non-investment cash flow for an extended period of time. Uh, we included uh, a graph that will go in, uh, was supposed to be included in the appendix, and uh, there was an oversight, but it's in your packet, uh, kind of in the pocket. It shows the non-investment cash flow uh, since 2001 for Paris. And in that, you can see that back in 2002, it was hovering right around zero, and then 2003, it dropped to almost minus 4%. It's been below negative uh, 4%, and uh, since 2014, uh, it's been below negative 10%. Uh, so we have very similar issues where we have a, a lot of uh, money going out of the plan. Uh, the contributions are not sufficient to uh, cover the benefits. Uh, again, we have a uh, funded ratio that has uh, dropped drastically over the past uh, couple, um, two decades. We went from 67% in 2001 to about 60% in 2007, and then since 2007, it's gone from 60 down to 35. So, the a big part of that is the negative non-investment cash flow. Um, you know, we have uh, this graph on page five, which is showing how the uh, plan is actually funded. So back in 2007, while they weren't fully funded, the inactive liability was. But since that point, um, now, now the most recent uh, actual valuation that we have from them is from 2017, um, and it shows that their uh, retiree liability isn't even 50% funded. So that clearly that all of these things are uh, a pretty big concern. Um, when we are looking at the uh, the plan changes and how things have um, have progressed over the past few years. There have been a number of uh, incremental uh, contribution increases, um, but I wanted to kind of direct you to the uh, the graph on the bottom of page six. There's a lot of focus on um, amortization period as uh, the measure of health, um, and so when you strictly look at amortization period, and if you're looking at a snapshot. Their uh, Paris Fire's amortization period has uh, generally been under 30 years, right? So if you look throughout history, uh, they've been under 30 years. So if you're looking at a snapshot and you're looking at amortization period only, then you would think that perhaps they are in a reasonable position. But if you look at some of these other metrics, you look at their cash flow, you look at their funded ratio, um, or even if you look at amortization period, the trend you want the amortization period to actually be going down, to be moving towards full funding. And the fact that it is <coughs> staying flat, staying at the exact same level, is also an indication that maybe something is going on and something needs to be addressed. So one of our concerns, one of our recommendations is that, uh, you know, that we do think it's important, and that's why uh, for the um, intensive reviews, we include uh, multiple uh, metrics uh, that we look at, that you need to be looking, you know, we want to remind um, the members in the systems that, you know, it, it is very important to be looking at multiple me uh, health metrics, looking at those trends, seeing how things are changing to determine whether, um, you know, something needs to, you need to be looking at something a, a little bit closer. So I do want to, you know, make a note that um, one of the reasons uh, I think that the amortization period has um, been relatively stable when they make contribution increases to address something is that they do have a flat benefit design. You can sort of see um, some of that in um, uh, the graph on page five where their active liability has essentially remained relatively stable. So because of the flat benefit design, it's really driven by the demographics as opposed to um, the, the, the salaries and changing in, and change in salaries, right? So the their 
when you are projecting where the plane is going, as uh, Marsha has uh, pointed out a, a couple of times uh, with respect to Odessa, is that the contribution is calculated as a percentage of pay. We are assuming pay is going to increase, so we are backloading the contributions. So when the benefits are not going up with pay, but all of the contributions are, uh, it can look um, much better unless those contributions aren't realized. And so it's a, a difficult um, balance to, you know, to know how you have to be looking at this. Uh, GASB does require that even with the flat benefit design, you're supposed to be valuing this on a, as a percentage of pay and looking at it as a percentage of pay. So that's generally the way it's going to be considered. But sometimes you know, we have to kind of take into account the fact that we are backloading these contributions every single time we are assuming contributions are going to increase at 3.5% every year, 3% or wherever they are at this point. Um, and many times when your, your um, active population is not growing, as uh, Brad said, if your active population isn't growing, then your actual total salary generally won't keep up with your, your payroll assumption either. And so that uh, can be part of the problem uh, here as well. So one of the things that uh, we are trying to um, identify, again, they have significant negative non-investment cash flow. Um, while they don't have uh, an exhaustion date, uh, it's primarily a function of uh, the increasing contributions while the benefits are not uh, increasing as quickly. I think that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, if you project this plan out to 40, 50 years, uh, it looks like it's moving towards full funding um, because of the differences in um, how those two items are, uh, are changing. But they still have a lot of issues um, in the near term with their cash flows. They are uh, also getting very close to being a pay-as-you-go plan. Again, the, the, um, the contributions that are coming in the door are turning around, going right back out uh, in the exact same way because, or, and what we've seen, what we're showing um, with, I'm trying to remember which graph we put it on, but basically if you look at um, their actual cash flow over the past, uh, I think we calculated it from 2000 or 2001, uh, it's decreased about $1.5 uh, $1 million. So they, they basically sold $1.5 million in order to pay benefits over the past two decades, in addition to all of the contributions and investment returns that they earned over the same period. So that's a big part of why their assets you know, went down is because they're having to tap their existing assets in order to pay benefits. Again, at a 35% funded level, that's a huge concern um, because it, they're not going to be moving in the right direction without uh, additional contributions. Uh, very similar, I'm not saying that, um, well, uh, given the flat benefit structure, they are also in a, a situation where benefits are very difficult to make adjustments to to address this. So contributions, again, are uh, the, the primary uh, lever that you're going to have to make any adjustments and uh, to make any changes. So that's one of the recommendations is that we are, um, you know, we are recommending that the fund and the city work together uh, as they develop their, their funding uh, policy uh, to look at what their long, short and long-term funding options are, what they need to be doing to uh, you know, uh, turn it around. Um, they are not subject to the new investment evaluation performance requirements, but I do believe that they can take some information from the guidance that we will be providing for those evaluations and consider um, looking at how their investments have been performing. Uh, one of the things that we uh, noted is that their, um, all of their investment returns net of fees have been short of their benchmark. So a number of their gross returns, when they're looking at the total, uh, the total fund benchmarking, uh, over a number of periods, the gross returns are beating the benchmark. But when you incorporate uh, actual fees, they consistently fall short of, uh, of that benchmark. So we are suggesting that they, they consider the 
value that they are getting for paying those fees and taking a closer look at, um, at, at what at, at how they are choosing to invest and uh, the level of active management versus passive management. Um, we're not making any specific suggestions regarding what they should be doing other than uh, uh, looking a little bit closer at it. We have uh, also raised some concern because only one of their board members is compliant with our minimum education training requirements. Uh, and as we note in here, uh, we have free online courses that um, it's and seven hours of training uh, there. So only one out of, uh, I believe, seven, seven, seven trustees ha has actually completed uh, all of the training and is compliant with all of our requirements. So we are uh, uh, also suggesting that um, uh, they take a close look at, at their practices get up to date, up to date on on uh, the education and training, and um, start looking a little bit closer at uh, some of the, the the ways in which they are um, governing uh, the board and some of their policies and procedures as well. So you don't have to go through a full uh, evaluation, performance, or governance um, review. Uh, there are other uh, avenues to kind of look at the policies and practices uh, of the board and, and compare those to uh, industry best practices and, and, and consider uh, additional changes. Thank you. Questions for Kenny? Thank you very much. Is there anyone here from the Paris, City of Paris or the Paris Fire and Police? Sorry, the Paris Fire Plant. Welcome. Thank you. If you would introduce yourself, if you would begin introducing yourself, please. Oh, hello. I'm Kim Calhoun. I'm with Westwood Wealth Management. We serve as trustee and investment manager for the plan. Sandy Collard, human resources manager. David Kent. I'm the actuary with RHI. I'm Bob Rast. I'm the chairman of the fund. You're the board chair? Yes, sir. Thank you. Does anybody have any prepared remarks you'd like to make? Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I can go ahead. Um, you kind of caught us in an actuarial line change. I've only been with the fund for about three months. Uh, they retained us three months ago to take over the actuarial duties. And I can just give you my impressions. When I looked at this plan, I thought it, just looking at the plan provisions, I thought it would be a model plan. It's doesn't have any kind of drop issues. It's a There are no interest rate guarantees on that. Drop is paid out, so we don't have these drop assets dragging us down. Like Kenny said, it's a flat dollar uh, benefit, $94 uh, per times years of service. Uh, the normal cost is 9.54% for that um, for that benefit. And as you know, Kenny mentioned, we value this um, entry age normal cost where that normal cost is a percent of pay. And generally, that doesn't change from year to year because the benefit is also, if pay changes, the benefit changes. Well, this benefit doesn't change. Ten years from now, if someone's total um, earnings, lifetime earnings, is much greater than it is now, the normal cost is going to go down. So that 9.54 is based on a $94 benefit and earnings today. As inflation increases, that 9.54 goes down every year. So, I mean, Kenny mentioned it was as the salaries increase, the benefits don't, and that's true. Um, this benefit is a, it's a very um, non-variable benefit. It's not risky at all. It's, uh, like I said, looking at it, that I, I thought this would be great. Um, we're getting 300, over 300% contributions. Um, the normal cost is 9.54. We're getting it 30% when you add the employee and employer. The employee, they were paying 15%. Um, that just went up to 16%. So the normal cost is 9.54. Employees are paying 16%. Uh, the city went from 12 to 14%. So we are getting well over 300% of the normal cost. Did you when say you the city is contributing 15%? The, the city is contributing 14%. Thank you. Both of those were changed um, late last year. Um, and that's not quite enough to uh, satisfy the ADC. Is that right? Uh, well, we're at 41 years. 
based on, well, I take that back. Uh, the last valuation was done 12 31 2016, and that puts us at 41 years. We haven't done a valuation since then. Do you know what the actually determined contribution rate is? It would have been 29% at 12 31 16. So as of 12 31 16, we were not quite there. We were at 28%. No, 27%. Close. We were close. Thank you. They changed the contribution rates. Now we're at 30%. So we were above where we were at 1231 16. Um, assets, as Kenny mentioned, were a problem. There's a new asset manager who's fairly new. Uh, so that's been addressed. And uh, again, I, I'm fairly new here, but from what I can tell, the relationship with the city is fantastic. They, I don't really see any difference really between the fund and the city. They work really well together. So coming in new with new eyes looking at this, um, it looks like long term, there's not a huge issue. Obviously, short term, there's a problem. We're 30% funded. Um, so, you know, I feel like we have a good team to work together to solve that issue. Um, but long term, I feel like uh, this fund is not in bad shape if we can get through the next five, ten years. Thank you. <clears throat> How long has Westwood been the asset manager? We were hired in the fall of 2014. Thank you. Um, the uh, data provided us suggests that the uh, investment performance is consistently falling short of benchmarks. Do you uh, disagree with any of the information that's provided by staff in this packet? Well, when we look at these periods, so this went through 2018, and there were, yes, some periods of underperformance, but, but all in, I think that the performance does look fairly strong. I think one of the one of the challenges that was written up in the report is the way that we report these assets. So we were reporting gross for the most part. That was in the 1231 report. And based on the recommendations uh, that you all had given, we have revamped the reporting. So I appreciate that you had that you brought that to our attention. There are several reports that we provide on a monthly basis where we were showing gross and net, but this particular year-end report, I had just pulled some particular reports that did not show gross and net. We recently met with the board a couple of weeks ago and are reporting everything gross and net. There was um, a particular time where we did have one asset class that did underperform and it really did drag down the performance of the fund. We have since moved away from that asset class and I think that will help with the volatility of returns. Are you a sole provider? You're providing the entirety of their investment consulting services? We are. Westwood Wealth Management is a state charter trust company. So we are in, uh, responsible for the investments as well as we do the custodial work, paying out the pension benefits, um, sending out the 1099 R's to the pensioners as well. Thank you. Mr. Rast, you're on the board. Yeah. Can you describe for us what a typical board meeting looks like with regard to the uh, investment management process? What do you get from the money manager in terms of reporting, discussion from the board, questions? How often do you uh, conduct RFPs of your investment consultant, asset managers, and so on? Uh, we've done one RFP since, uh, that I remember, none since I've been on the board this recent, most recent time. How long have you time. been on the board? Uh, less than two years. Okay. Uh, we ha we have our monthly meeting. Have a month uh, e a meeting every month. We uh, go through. We get a report from Westwood. The board looks at the report, uh, and I mean that's the extent of it. We you know we don't question their ability to invest money because that's why we hired them. So. Uh, uh, well, maybe that touches on another issue that the staff has brought up, and that is that most of your board members have not um, complied with state law regarding minimum education trustee requirements. Correct, and I'll address that. Uh, we, as a board, did see that we were in trouble. Uh, we have sent... Trouble in what way? Uh, that the fund was underperforming. Okay. You, uh, underperforming in assets or funding condition? Both. Okay. Uh, we did away with our administrator. Uh, we had a plan administrator, and, and we let her go. That uh, was a city employee. It was not. She was a hired. contract worker. Right. Okay. Uh, since then, we've put that in house. I do. I do most of that, and I have neglected to keep up with everybody's CE. I am going to Telfer this year, and as Kenny stated, we're a seven-member board, but we are one member short. So we've only got six members 
Uh, we are in the process of replacing one of the board members as they retired. Um, so I will do a better job and get people caught up on their compliance. <clears throat> One of the uh, components of the minimum education uh, trustee uh, program is fiduciary duty. Correct. Uh, fundamental to fiduciary duty is a duty of care. Duty of care means performing the due diligence. That means doing the work. Right. <clears throat> Part of the work is challenging the consultants and as to whether or not they're meeting their benchmarks, whether or not they're producing for the plan. Those trustees have a solemn a serious responsibility on behalf of the plan participants. Correct. And if they haven't met the minimum educational trustee requirements, and if the asset manager is consistently underperforming, it's not on the asset manager ultimately, it's on the trustees. That's their job, to ask the, trust, to ask the money manager, why are we getting the, this level of performance? What can we do differently? It's really not enough to just get a report and look at the numbers. You've got to call the consultant in, ask them, put them on the hot seat, challenge them. How long is the contract in place right now for this particular asset manager? Uh, undetermined until the board says that we would like a change and would send out RFPs. So it's indefinite, it's open-ended? Correct. Other questions for the... Well, I, I would again go, I mean, this is less than five million dollars in this fund, which if it were in my bank account, that would look like a lot of money, but we're talking about securing benefits for, you know, approximately a hundred people. Um, so, you know, I, I look at on page 14 of the, of the review, um, there's a, a discussion of asset allocation. And, and again, my reaction to that is where you have target allocations of 50% in equities, 30% fixed income, 20% in alternatives, including real estate. I, I, you know, at $5 million, I'm thinking, and with, you know, 10% negative cash flow, I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, this is not, this doesn't seem right. And again, don't know the particulars until you study it, but, but it just seems to me that there's, there's something that needs to be addressed with respect to asset allocation. And then correspondingly, David, just again, you know, even at a seven and a half percent interest rate, which I know you're only three months into this, I think you've got to look at it, because again, you know, I'm I'm not sure that that current you know uh, market uh, information would lead you to a seven and a half percent interest rate, um, considering the negative cash flows um, with with even anything close to this. You know, if you're going to focus on a near term ten to fifteen year outlook you know if they if that was a less mature plan and you could look 30 years that'd be one thing but but again looking at this you know over the short term it to me there's a, a great concern here um, I would like to ask the assistant city manager um, right now there were 49 actives and 41 annuitants how is can you tell me does is Paris stable is it growing is it contracting I'm, I'm not the assistant city manager, I'm, oh. the, I'm the human resources, resources. manager. Um, but, but Paris is a very um, flat city. It's, it's not decreasing, but it's not increasing either. And it's been the same for decades, I would say. So we're not looking at a situation like Odessa where maybe no. we could say the number of firefighters will increase or anything. No. So we're looking at a stable population. Yes. Um, yes. So, so again, to me, the forecasting is going to be really important here. Excuse me, may I speak to that asset allocation just for clarification purposes mm -hmm. for you all? The way that we have categorized when we, when we look at the world of investing, traditional equities, traditional fixed income, and in what we call that specialty uh, category, don't want that to be misleading, so that's why I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. What we are viewing that as is non-correlated assets, so some multi-asset um, multi classes that may not fit into a traditional equity or to, into a traditional bond. So for example, the real estate investment in there, those are publicly traded real estate investment trusts. There's an investment in master limited partnerships. Everything in there is liquid. It was just a categorization part. If you look at the portfolio, I would say that it's roughly 
probably 62% invested in equities. If we were to actually break that out into a traditional equity fixed income allocation, probably that 62% would be allocated to traditional equities. I, I, a year ago, um, the board uh, prepared a report for the legislature, I believe, on um, trying to ask some of the smaller funds to look at pooling for asset management. To me, this is um, a classic example of a group that should, that perhaps you should consider looking to pool with other plans. Not necessarily, not change your administration or, or anything like that, but, but pool with other plans in order to achieve better expense ratios and perhaps better investment returns. Okay. I mean, and, and I don't know what the status of, of the follow-up to that report was, but I think there was going to be more study. But again, to me, this is like a textbook example of someone, of a group that should consider, you know, perhaps working with others to try to achieve better investment returns net of expenses. Mr. Kent, given the uh, significantly low negative cash flow and the uh, sharp decline in the funding level over the last few years, um, do you know whether the plan has plans to conduct an asset liability study? Uh, I don't know if they have done that yet. We, we've not even done our um, first uh, actuarial study yet, but I would assume once we get the first actuarial report done, um, I would recommend that we do modeling, stochastic modeling, deterministic modeling, stress testing to see you know what needs to be done over the short term. Uh, you know, to solve this solution. I mean, it's a pretty easy solution. We need more money, but <laughs> it's easier to say than to actually get done. But yeah, I, I mean, I, my recommendation is to definitely do some modeling near term and long term to see, you know, where we are and what we need to do. And would that modeling include a consideration or reconsideration of the uh, investment return assumption? Uh, well, before we issue any statement of actual opinion, so before we do our next valuation, we'll take a look at all these, um, all of these results. Um, and the assumptions. I know that the prior actuary just did an experience study. Uh, there weren't anything that really made my head jerk up. I mean, you know, 7.5, Marcia said it's a little bit high, but it's also a, a return that a lot of people have. Whenever we do our, our evaluation, we'll look at this specific plan and see, does it make sense for this specific plan? Um, mortality table, I don't know that that was up to date either, and that's probably one we'll be making a recommendation for. Uh, most of the others uh, didn't look, or most of them went in a more conservative way, so we'd like to see that. Well, the staff has prepared a chart here that I presume that you've seen that shows that by far the leading cause of the uh, plan's unfunded liability is the shortfall in investment returns. That they were expecting significantly more revenue from investment returns than they have gotten. Yes. That's the problem. And whether or not one thinks 7.5% <coughs> excuse me, is an appropriate assumption is really academic. The fact is that their investment returns are consistently falling significantly short of expectations. And there's a problem here. There is a serious problem. There, it, as a matter of fact, I, and I don't have the history of the plan, but I know in 2013, the average return for these funds was 15% and we returned 2%. I don't know what happened that year, but I mean, I'm assuming that's one of the big drivers in that. And as with Odessa, when you've got a negative cash flow that significantly exceeds the return assumption, you're only going south. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I, again, I would just like to point out, I think there was a, a recent NASRA study um, <clears throat> for investment return assumptions by plans, and these were the 130 large um, public plans, mostly state level plans, where you presume that there's a lot of um, understanding of investment uh, acumen. And of, of this 130, two thirds, 66 percent of those plans, 86 plans, are now using a, an expected return on assets of less than 7.5 percent. And so, you know, again, I always say you, you can't look at averages to set your expected return, but Again, with the, the understanding of the particulars of this plan with the large negative cash flow and the low funded status, it's very concerning to see it at even at 7.5%. So um, I, would, I would just say there's, it, it really bears looking at. Any other comments you would like to make? 
May I add one thing, just Please. so again that you all have full clarification of this. But on the fees on your report, because we failed to, in our 1231-18 report, which is what you all were looking at, we failed to produce that net number for you. You kind of backed into it, and basically that was the full fees paid divided by that 1231-18 market value. Obviously, with what happened in the market and that market value being lower, it overstated the amount of fees that they're paying. I think that your report showed about 103 basis points in investment management fees. Actually, what the fund pays at $5 million in assets, it's about 90 basis points. And that full 90 basis points includes the services of advisory services, which would include asset allocation, manager selection, all of that, as well as the custodial services. We pay out all the benefits, send out the 1099-Rs, help with some administrative work, and then the investment management. So if we were to break that out and unbundle that, Probably the custodial services at about 10, the advisory services 20 to 30. So investment management fees would be about 50 to 60. So just wanted you all to have Thank a you clear for that picture of what that looks That's like. helpful. Thank you. Is Kenny still in the room? <coughs> Kenny? Um, with that clarification, would those uh, administrative expenses still be, or investment <coughs> expenses still be higher than the peer group? I don't know compared to the peer group, but I do know that the most recent um, uh, investment book that they provided to the board still showed that their net, and I don't know what investment, what net returns they're showing they're including, but their net returns are still lower than their benchmarks. That was the point I was trying to make, is that the, I think the one year, all of the periods that are shown, they show, uh, I think year to date, most recent quarter, you know, three years since inception, all of those compared to their total fund benchmark net of fees is below the benchmark uh, uh, rate. The benchmark. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. We know it's a long way to Austin, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to direct staff to finalize the draft intensive review of the Paris Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund, incorporating changes agreed upon by the committee and any technical changes to present to the full board for final review at its October 17th meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. The ayes are unanimous. <clears throat> Thank you. On to informal guidance for developing funding policy emanating from Senate Bill 2224. I would ask Michelle Cranes to please come forward and talk to us. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Good afternoon. As you know, the legislature enacted a PRB recommendation regarding funding policies for public retirement systems. At its last meeting, the board requested staff work with the actuarial committee on guidance for systems and their sponsors implementing SB 2224. I plan to cover some of the highlights of the draft guidance in front of you. From a global perspective, staff's goal was really to produce a document that systems and their sponsors could use at a practical level to develop a funding policy, breaking down the various components, and to, for us, uh, a goal for uh, as well was to give examples of how even fixed rate plans can adopt funding policies that target full funding. The first component of uh, the guidance is establishing funding objectives, and of course, as you know, the bill requires that systems as they develop their, their uh, funding policies target 100% funding. PRB's recommendation, or staff's recommendation, of course, is to add to that to specify a time period over which full funding would be targeted, um, one that's in line with PRB funding guidelines and that uses a closed period, such as 25 years, or essentially as brief as possible as we have in the guidelines, um, but is in that range of 10 to 25 years. The second component covered in the guidance is to select actuarial methods that will be used by the plan. And we've provided a table with uh, information on three key methods. The third component 
has to do with developing a roadmap to achieve the target of full funding. And I wanted to take a minute here because we, we tried to expand on the discussion in the interim study um, to show how a fixed rate plan might actually achieve this in practice. So even if contributions are not made at the ADC rate, an ADC based on a closed period should be used as a benchmark representing the actual cost of plan benefits. So I'll walk through an example of how, how this might work. Um, so if we take a plan whose funding policy includes an objective to target 100% funding over a 25 year closed period, the first step, as, as I mentioned, would be to set the benchmark ADC, and in this case it would be at 25 years, for both the existing liability and any future gains and losses. Then each year, the plan and sponsor would compare their current actual contribution with that ADC rate reported in the valuation. The second step would be to establish triggers in the funding policy for action if and when the actual contribution differs from the ADC by a certain amount over a certain number of years. And an example of that could be um, if the actual contribution were lower than the ADC benchmark rate by 3% over a period of three years. The third step would be to identify in the funding policy steps that would be taken to close that gap once the triggers were hit. Section four, uh, or the, uh, the, the fourth component of, of fun, the funding policy guidance in front of you, then tries to give examples of the types of steps that can be included in funding policies and have already been included, uh, such as by, by plans such as Fort Worth, to move the contribution in the proper direction. We also discuss risk sharing strategies that can be used to distribute unexpected costs along the way. So uh, I'll use the example of Fort Worth Employees Retirement Fund. Um, it actually provides examples of three of the techniques we mention in the guidance, those being ADC benchmarking, which I've just uh, attempted to, to explain, using a maximum contribution rate, and risk sharing. So as part of its reform package, the actual contribution is compared to the ADC for Fort Worth each year. Then beginning in 2022, if the actual rate is less than the ADC, ADC rate for two consecutive years, city and employee contributions will be increased by no more than 2% of pay in one year or 4% total. The increase is split 60% uh, between the city 60% and employees 40%. So that's the risk sharing element. Uh, and then if the maximum allowed contribution is applied and the ADC is still not met, the city must consider additional benefit reductions. So there you see the use of that maximum contribution rate uh, and a trigger for additional action. Then I also wanted to give Galveston employees retirement for police as another example of risk sharing. This session, as you'll remember, the legislature passed HB 2763, which in line with recommendations from this board, established a strong funding policy for the plan. Beginning January 1st, 2025, if the valuation includes an ADC that exceeds the aggregate employee and city contribution rate, the difference in contribution will be split equally as a percentage of pay between the city and employees. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions and what we've put before you today. Thank you very much, uh, members. Before we go to questions for Michelle, what I think might be best would be to uh, allow members of the public to uh, share their thoughts on this so that when we consider this and we uh, think about what we've been presented with, we can have the benefit of uh, possible other comments as well. Does that sound okay? Does that sound okay, Marcia? Yeah. Um, before you go, I want to thank you for this. This is excellent work that you've done. Kenny, your work also was very well done. We are fortunate at the PRB to have uh, such staff resources. Thank you. It's uh, all very well done. Um, and stay tuned. Let's see if anybody wants to come up and share their comments. So this is an invitation to the public to comment on uh, the funding policy issue, um, what Michelle has presented, 
what you th what thoughts you might have. And uh, if anybody has any comments, we are going to start by limiting them to three minutes, if you would, please, so we can keep things moving. Anybody wish to come forward and talk about this? You really did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chair, I would, if there are no public comments, I do have a couple of follow-up items. I would like um, to consider uh, a further modification in the amortization policy, and it goes to um, something that I mentioned before, which is that when uh, developing an amortization amount for this target contribution, I, I think it should not be acceptable. It sh we should not have negative um, amortization of the unfunded. That means the amortization charge should be at least equal to interest on the unfunded and and some amortization of the unfunded whether it's a 1 30th of the outstanding balance but but the fact that with um, amortization charges being calculated using increasing pay um, we have situations where you know you could have 15 years of negative amortization before you actually start contributing toward the unfunded liability so I would like to include a provision that um, that negative amortization is not acceptable, and this I believe this is also a position that the Society of Actuaries and other actuarial groups are are starting to uh, formalize when they're giving guidance on uh, actuarial uh, policy for public plans. <clears throat> I guess I would say that uh, maybe we could ask uh, uh, maybe we could ask some folks about that. Um, I think my understanding is that by definition, if you if you have a an amortization period of 25 years or longer, maybe even 20 years or longer, you're going to have negative amortization. Right. Um, and in my opinion, and I'm not an actuary, you are, uh, but. Negative amortization by itself is not necessarily a problem. Um, I think more important is that uh, trustees, fiduciaries know when they're engaged in negative amortization. I think that has not always been the case in the public sector, that negative amortization has been taking place and some folks did not know about it. But uh, a growing population, a growing payroll can overcome and is intended to overcome negative am amortization. And I'm a little worried about employing a sort of a blanket prohibition against negative amortization because I think there are instances in which negative amortization may be appropriate. Um, I wonder if you would be amenable to language that uh, um, cautions against the use of amortization and make sure that there's adequate transparency in cases of uh, negative amortization. I think at this point, because this is guidance um, and we haven't seen a strong position come out from the actuarial standards yet, um, I, I am amenable to, you know, at, at least a strong caution against and, and uh, against negative amortization. Um, but but I do think we could be moving in a situation where down the road we, we might be wanting to say that it, negative amortization is not acceptable. But but at this point, and again, until I learn more, like you say, there may be some situations where perhaps it is um, acceptable. But but I do think it's one of those um, devices that has, has caused many of these plans to um, kind of uh, fall behind. Yeah, I agree. Uh, for example, a 30-year open amortization period uh, is just kicking the can down the yeah, road. And absolutely. That has been uh, a present in the public sector, and you see that over time those plans are not improving their funding condition, they're not paying down their, uh, their unfunded liability. Um, and PRB guidelines, and maybe we can incorporate this into the, uh, into the guidance, but uh, PRB guidelines themselves say something like 15 to 25 years is an appropriate time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if, if you are amenable to uh, having staff work on language that cautions against the use of uh, negative amortization and make sure there's adequate transparency, uh, I'd be uncomfortable with that also. I, I w I'd be comfortable at this point, and again, you know. And we can revisit it. Just revisit it. Uh, put this into broader context, uh, Anu, can you speak briefly to um, what we're doing here? That is, this is informal guidance, and eventually we'll be asked to provide formal guidance. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah, so this is 
informal guidance. You're exactly right, uh, Mr. Chairman. We, because of time constraints, we wanted to make sure systems have a deadline of January of 2020 to come up with the funding policies. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we are swift in providing the informal guidance at this ju juncture. Down the line, the board has the option because the statute uh, allows the board to consider formalizing these uh, this guidance into rules. So that is certainly an option for the board to consider down the line, depending, and, and the board could uh, take a wait and watch approach to see the policies coming out of uh, the, the policies that the systems are developing, how the guidance is helping uh, the plans to develop those policies and could build upon uh, that uh, information when the board wants to consider uh, adopting these in rules. Thank you, that's helpful. Any questions for Anu on that? On the, on the status of what we're working on. Everybody good with that, where we are? Um, members, I do want to add, since we, did, we no one came up to provide any comments, we will post the draft guidance next week to, uh, on our website and solicit public input. Hopefully we will receive some comments in writing. Yes. And we'll, we'll go back out for comments in, in, a mo in just a moment. One other remark I'd like to make, which is that uh, many plans, maybe most plans in the, in the state, are fixed rate contribution plans. Um, and for many of these plans, there's no mechanism in place, certainly no statutory mechanism, and in a lot of places, uh, no funding policy uh, mechanism to make sure that uh, ultimately the assets and the, li the liabilities come together. And I think the evidence for that is uh, ample. When you look at these, uh, these reports that we see regularly here, there's a lot of plans in which you've got assets going one way and you've got liabilities going another way, and there's no policy there at all to make sure that they ever come together. And uh, I commend the legislature for passing this bill to uh, at least require that people are aware uh, of that situation and to require them to have a, a contingency plan in case, uh, um, in case they need to, uh, to use it. I'll just add, please, that we've tried to cover uh, the, the various elements in the guidance and give examples, but certainly we haven't covered everything, and we're happy to work with systems, and we already have with, uh, with some who would like to contact us and ask for you know, with our thoughts um, and even send us what they're, what they're working on um, so that we can provide additional assistance. Thank you. I, I hope everybody heard that. Anu? Yes, absolutely ag agree with Ms. Michelle 100%. There are some new concepts in here. We are happy to answer any questions um, and really appreciate input that um, our stakeholders can provide either today down or down the line uh, through uh, public comments and writing. Sir, would you please come forward and introduce, introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. My name is uh, Chuck Campbell. I'm with Jackson Walker, a law firm. I'm a public pension attorney and represent various uh, pension plans in the state. I, I appreciate all the work that the uh, staff's done in, in terms of providing some guidance with the funding policy. I thought it was a very helpful guidance in terms of uh, particularly under the time frames that you had to, to put something out, so certainly appreciate that. Uh, one, one thing, and I think you touched on it, uh, Mr. Brainerd, in terms of the abilities that you know the the statute provides that governing boards are adopting the funding policies, and what a funding what a board of trustees in itself varies from statute to statute and plan to plan in terms of what they can do, in terms of adjusting benefits or contribution levels. Some of them can't. There's there's nothing they can do themselves, or or they may have to have um, a member election to change benefits, or they're going to have to have city approval for, for uh, with respect to contribution rates. Um, and, and a funding policy certainly can have the elements that, you know, when there's certain conditions, you know, certain steps need to be taken, but the board that's adopting the policy may not be able to properly put in its a policy, <laughs> we're going to adjust benefits or we're going to increase contributions because it's not something that board can do. Um, certainly the funding policy can state that they there, there might be something aspirational in there with respect to what a board can do, um, but, but sometimes the board's hands are tied. And I just think from a fiduciary perspective, a recognition that those policies, there may be that gap, so to speak, is an important aspect from a, from a fiduciary lawyer's perspective. Yeah, I think that's a point very well taken, is that w this legislation really only addresses half of the, uh, if that, of the authority. And uh, the authority to fund benefits um, and uh, alter benefits in some cases lies outside of the plans in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that's a very point where very well taken. I believe that the uh, staff's write-up does encourage plans to uh, include as much as possible the plan sponsor. 
the government entities, and uh, we hope that, uh, of course, that uh, government entities, cities, and uh, and the state and others will uh, work with uh, with the funds in developing this funding policy because that their participation is vital. Thanks for making so that point. Sure. Anybody else wish to make comments about this? Other questions, comments from the committee? If not, I would entertain a motion to direct staff to finalize the guidance for developing a funding policy, incorporating changes agreed upon by the committee, and any technical changes for recommendation to the full board for final review at its October 17th meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It passes unanimously. Thank you. And with that, we are going to recess. We will recess until tomorrow morning, 9.30, this same room. Have a good night.